Jeff Bukas served as the CEO of Time Warner from 2008 until about 2018. I think that makes him my boss's boss's boss at a certain stage. He oversaw companies like CNN, HBO, Warner Brothers, Time Inc. magazine at one time AOL as well. Before landing at Time Warner, he served as the chair of Time Warner's Entertainment and Networks Group. Prior to that, he was the CEO of HBO, where he was responsible for overseeing the company's move to produce original content. Hey, Jeff, it's so great to have you here. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Michael. Great to be here with you. You know, I am often asked, people will say to me, who was who was the best guest? You've been doing this for 30 years. Who's the best radio guest you've ever had? And when I give them a definitive answer, I'll say two men from South Philadelphia, Wild Bill Guanier and Babe Heffron, who grew up blocks away from one another, but didn't know each other till they were overseas and became two of the band of brothers. And of course it was on your watch, right? That that show, The Sopranos and so many others came to fruition. Yeah, and I knew those two guys. We were, you know, they were actually there when we premiered the uh, band of brothers and we did it the first day in Normandy at the site of the D-Day landings. And those guys were sitting there looking at the screening, which was the when one of them had his leg uh, taken by a, Wild um, Bill. And we were, uh, and I was quite concerned that, what, that we were going to do this accurately. And uh, I remember when the lights came up, they looked at each other and said, that's just how it happened, Bill. Isn't that just how it happened? It was the best thing. I mean, I, I, I got to say I cried, but it was the best thing. It's so great that you weighed in today on Francis Halgen, the Facebook whistleblower and the important issues that surround section 230 at smirconish.com. And I want people to go there and read what Jeff Bucus has offered, but I don't want to speak for you. How would you sum up how you come at this issue? Well, um, there's a lot of attention. We've all, what is the issue first? It's like, we're all trying to figure out is there, what do we do about misinformation uh, particularly disinformation, defamation and falsehoods that are circulating, whether it's on you know, the television or whether it's on the internet. And it seems that there's a lot of it going on the internet services. So the, the first thing is, I don't think that um, the solution to improving our, the accuracy and of our dialogue I don't think it lies in vilifying, this isn't against the social media companies. They're, they've done a lot of good. We ought to recognize the legitimate contribution they make to connecting people, bringing the dialogue, there's tremendous innovation. They've created a lot of value for shareholders, they're good employers. So we ought to keep and preserve that. But like any media, like the TV news channels that rose up before that era, there are also potential harms and there's certain responsibility that goes with putting out all these messages. I don't think the answer lies in regulation. I think it's really deregulation. I would look at it more as a graduation present for these internet and social media companies. And what I mean by that is if CNN or Fox, or you, if, you if, if CNN or Fox chooses to put on the air and broadcast out to millions of people, a guest who's going to speak and spew out false and defamatory information. And if we choose to do that, and we're making money off of disseminating it to millions of people, then yes, that person can be held liable for false def defamation. And a CNN or a Fox putting it on can be held liable too. That's evolved over many years. It does not conflict with free speech. But if that person does the same exact thing on a social media platform, yes, the person can be held responsible, but the social media platform that amplifies it to millions of people cannot be held responsible. They have a liability shield that was installed by the Congress back in 1996 called Section 230. And the thinking there, I think it needs a little adjustment the thinking was, and it was quite understandable, that at the dawn of the internet with these new ISPs, the Congress wanted to encourage 
uh, the construction of the internet, and they didn't want people, you know, the, the companies building those wires that now became the internet, they didn't want them to be responsible for what individuals said to each other over the internet. The same thing with the telephone. The telephone company's not responsible if you go on the phone system and defame somebody. But the difference is, and this is where I think nobody had anticipated social media or what would evolve. If those companies who say usually, well, we're just putting up a platform or a bulletin board and if somebody wants to post something, another person wants to read it, that's not our responsibility, what they're saying. I think they're right about that. But if they choose to intervene, pull that post up and send it out to millions of people, using their massive data mining to figure out who to send it to, then they're making an active choice to publish it. And then they ought to share some responsibility in the same way that if, if you or if CNN put a guest on and sent it out to everybody, you have a duty to figure out if what they're saying is false and defamatory. And there's been a hundred years of, uh, precedent to try to figure out what is the right level of responsibility a given newspaper or TV network, or in this case, social network ought to have, given the reality and the difference of their platform versus the old news broadcast platforms. And I think a, a recent example is this uh, Fox and Newsmax, Newsmax broadcast some people that put out false and defamatory claims, or so they were uh, charged with against these voting machine companies, Dominion and Smartmatic. And uh, those companies who felt they were their reputation and business were harmed filed suits for financial damage against both the individuals and those news outlets. And we don't know whether uh, what the facts will be and what the judgment will be, but they couldn't make the same filing against a Facebook or a YouTube if they aired the same thing. And I think that given the trillions of dollars now in, in, you know, that those companies are worth, they can invest money just like CNN does or Fox does to try to uh, do some fact checking and editorial standards when they're going and disseminating deliberately messages. And there are some, this is not, by the way, my idea. This came, I think Francis Haugen put it forward in her testimony. There's another man named Roddy, Roddy Lindsay, I believe, who um, wrote an editorial about it. I don't want to put false words in their mouths if I got it wrong, what they said. But I think a number of people have put this forward. It doesn't focus on any particular type of content or target audience. It just generally says if you're going to amplify something, you ought to take some responsibility for it. You wrote in the essay that you provided me, if they really were a bulletin board, this is Jeff Bucus responding to the social media platforms who say, hey, liability shouldn't attach because we're just like a bulletin board. You say if they really were a bulletin board where users could choose which posts they wanted to see, then they shouldn't be responsible for what users say. But the reference you're making to Francis Halgen's testimony and the algorithms, it sounds to me that's what changes the calculus for your analysis. Yeah, I would ask you, maybe you could decide. What's the difference between you personally taking uh, what some guest says on your show and deciding to send it out across the country if you had millions of users? Or let's say you program a, uh, an algorithm to do it for you. Isn't, aren't both of those things active decisions to promote a certain, um, you know, speech content? And don't you have some responsibility if that's what you're doing to find out before you do that, whether it's false and defamatory? Well, I agree with you. I don't, I don't know if they, if they have the capability of policing the content, but I think that we need to go in that direction. And I also appreciate your point, which is that maybe Section 230, as written, uh, established the Internet and fulfilled its purpose. And what was your word choice that maybe this is a graduation of sorts for these platforms that they've now moved on to 
let's say, the Time Warner level. Well, right. Uh, they've created a lot of value. So again, we ought to repeat, this is not against them. They certainly have enough money to invest in uh, some amount of, uh, you know, policing, policing editing of what they're doing. Now, yeah. people often jump when they, they pe this gets distorted often, where critics say, oh, you're trying to regulate speech. Are you trying to, you know, infringe on my free speech? No, quite the opposite. This is not regulation. This is not any part of government action to punish, penalize, or do anything to anybody's speech. This is simply removing a regulation the government put in that selectively gave liability to, to one kind of company, let's say uh, a social media company, at least under the current. And it, that same shield of liability doesn't exist at CNN or at uh, Smirconish Media. Quote, Section 230 should be revised so that powerful, profit-maximizing social networks bear responsibility for content that they choose to amplify, whether by human decision or algorithmic decision programmed by humans, if the context they selectively amplify and deliver to particular profiled users to drive profitability is false and defamatory, they should not be shielded from liability. That's, that's the conclusion you come to. Yeah. Yes. And I think that just as we over the last hundred years evolved reasonable standards for what a originally a newspaper company, then a radio company, then a television network, then cable news networks. Over all those innovations, we evolved some level of a reasonable context to decide how much responsibility should each of those mass media platforms have for defamation. Um, I just think we ought to let that old American ingenuity act again in this new and even more powerful and more profitable industry that is the internet and social media industry. Um, if, if a CNN and uh, an NBC News can invest money as we have over the last decades to, to make sure our content is responsible, that doesn't mean that we don't go ahead and air controversial content. It's just that we're, we bear responsibility if we do it in a recklessly defamatory way. I wanna just bring this conversation full circle because I made a Sopranos reference early on. When I interviewed Stevie Van Zant recently, it was because he published a memoir and he's a very political guy. You probably know that about him. I really didn't appreciate it about him until I read the book, but he goes so far as to publish his own platform in the back of the book. And on this issue, social media and the incivility and the destructiveness that sometimes comes from it, he says, people's names ought to be used. It reminded me of growing up in a small town. And if you wanted to write a letter to the editor, you had to affix your name. And presumably you'd get a call from the newspaper making sure that it was really you. Today, so much of this viciousness spreads from people who develop beer muscles. They know they won't be held accountable, so they say whatever the hell they want to say, whereas if you ever saw them in, in the town square, that wouldn't be the case. Any thought on that issue? Well, I, I haven't thought about it, but I think you're right. I mean, we'd all like to know if it's Chucky saying all this crazy stuff. And if it's Vladimir, we'd like to know that too, wouldn't we? Yes. Yeah. I just don't know if any amount of artificial intelligence or any number of employees for a Facebook is going to be able to police um, all of this the way that I think would be uh, would be necessary. Final thought that Jeff Bucus wants to leave us with relative to the issue of of Section 230 and social media platforms would be what? Well, I'm, I, I guess um, I'm a little concerned that I may not know all of the unanticipated consequences of what this is of what this would do. And I don't want to chill the, uh, I don't want to chill the uh, exchange of ideas in the country. So I'm inviting everybody by saying this to go ahead and shoot at it, but let's get the conversation. Oh, I know I have one more thought, here it is. There are a number of bills in Congress that 
you could mistake for being in this same direction. And what I mean by that is instead of just saying, look, we're just going to make, we'd like to remove a certain part of the liability shield so that companies with the ability to do so can, can have some responsibility for their content, not to the government, but to people that claim they're harmed by what they're doing. There are other bills that essentially focus on this type of content or that type of content, or if the content harms this protected audience or that disadvantaged audience. I don't think those are the right approaches because what those would entail, kind of selective removal of liability shield, those would put a burden on one kind of speech versus another kind of speech. And while that's not a government um, infringing on your right to speak, there's a certain amount of precedent coming out of our courts, constitutional precedent that says, look, even though it's not the government which is restrained by the First Amendment, can't tell you what to put on or what to take off. If the government, through the legislative branch, acts to selectively burden this speech but not that speech, that itself may bring First Amendment challenges to it. And I think it's the wrong way to go because you've got basically uh, people on the right side of the aisle saying that the social companies are suppressing conservative speech, you got people on the other side of the aisle saying, we don't like speech that's in this category or hurts these people. I don't think that either of those uh, should factor into it. I think we simply ought to make the, uh, make, try to make um, a level, more level playing field between a CNN and a Wall Street Journal with a Facebook and a YouTube. Because obviously- what I'm taking yeah, sorry. What I'm taking away from you is that you think something needs to change and you want to start the dialogue and conversation. And by the way, you might not have it all figured out. That's right. Okay. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Hey, this was great fun. Will you come back and, and can we talk only about HBO-ish kind of issues next time? Well, yeah, but you know, there's a book coming out about HBO in a month by James Andrew Miller. It's the history of HBO. It's got everybody's voice. So it won't just be my opinion, it'll be everybody else's. I think he interviewed 700 people. I think it'll be, I haven't read it, but I think it's going to be a very lively look at how did The Sopranos get made? How did Larry Sanders get made? And what oh. kind of, uh, what kind of, uh, so, frankly, we, 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 we almost uh, made mistakes. Many of our biggest breakthroughs were, were uh, mistakes and some of our greatest uh, decisions failed. So it's a, it'll kind of give you the real live circus that went on to make HBO. Well, I love his style because I read his book about SNL and I read his book about CNA, CAA and it's a conversation among all the major players. So I, I'm the ripe audience for it. One last thing, and I apologize for keeping you way beyond what I said that I would, but I, sh I should have led with the Larry Sanders show. I yeah. loved Gary Shandling. I love that show. I loved uh, Jeffrey Tambor. Hey, now I loved Artie Rip Torn. I mean, my God, that was television genius. Yeah, and actually, yeah, that the, the guy who did that is Michael Fuchs. That was uh, that really put us on the map, and uh, it came out of uh, a real brilliant sense of comedy that Michael had. He was one, he was really the founder of HBO's original programming. He did not just Sanders, but many other of the great stand-ups that you remember. You probably forgot they were all on HBO, um, and you know. They were put there by Michael Fuchs, who uh, was kind of our first leader on breaking through. Jeff, please come back. Thank you for being so gracious with your time. Thank you. I really appreciate Thank yeah. you. Jeff Bucus, ladies and gentlemen, that was a fun conversation, as promised.